500 days have now passed since the Fukushima nuclear crisis in Japan began. And one thing's clear, it's still an extremely dangerous situation. Japanese newspapers reporting the plant operators still face a number of hurdles before they can decommission the plant and officially close the book on the crisis. And it could take decades. One of those hurdles includes trying to determine why 8 million becquerels of radioactive cesium still continues to pour out of reactor number two every single hour. And plant operators still have no clue how they're going to remove massive pools of highly radioactive spent fuel from the roofs of the reactors. As the newspaper reports, not only will that work be unprecedented, but the work will also have to be done in an environment of high radiation levels. Oh, and then there's the situation with Reactor 4, which could collapse at any moment, triggering a worldwide nuclear disaster worse than Chernobyl. For more on this, let's turn it over to Carl Grossman, investigative reporter and professor of journalism at the State University of New York and author of the book, Cover Up What You Are Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power. We're now 500 days since the crisis began. Just how big of a mess is Fukushima still? Uh, it's, it's an ongoing disaster, a, a catastrophe, a catastrophe for the people and other life in Japan, a catastrophe for people and other life all over the globe. Uh, the radiation is still streaming out of the Fukushima Daiichi complex. It's been going on for, as you say, 500 days. The consequences, we're talking about grave impacts. And a point I'd like to make, which mainstream media just have not touched in all these many months, the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power worldwide, historically, General Electric and Westinghouse, 80% of nuclear power plants worldwide are manufactured or designed by either General Electric or Westinghouse. What happened in 2009? Well, a company called Toshiba bought Westinghouse, and later in 2009, a company called Hitachi partnered with General Electric in its nuclear division. So now the, the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power worldwide are basically Japanese brands. Amazing. Which amazing. has given Carl, the Carl, we're officials up, in Japan. We're, we're out of time, but I, it, it, that's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank it could take years for engineers to figure out exactly what caused the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. High radiation levels are keeping them from accessing parts of the plant. Different teams investigating the disaster have come up with their own conclusions. A government plan panel released its report just this week. We're going to look at how the various findings compare on today's nuclear watch, and we'll also examine the debate over whether the accident was preventable. The March 11th earthquake and tsunami caused serious damage to Fukushima Daiichi. A full-scale loss of power triggered meltdowns in three reactors. The crisis revealed the failures Tokyo Electric Power Company and nuclear regulators made before the accident and while it was ongoing. Discussion on whether the disaster was preventable has yet to run its course. TEPCO concluded in its report released in June, a tsunami beyond expectations caused the accident. It insisted the event was unpreventable. On the other hand, members of a diet-appointed panel stressed this month in their report the accident was man-made. They concluded if preventive measures had been taken before 2011, the accident might not have happened. NHK World's Hiroshi Yokokawa has been following this story. So Hiroshi, TEPCO analysts say the accident was not preventable, whereas experts on the diet panel say the accident was actually man-made. What do members of the government-appointed committee say? They say it was difficult to predict tsunami. But they criticized TEPCO for not taking preventive measures mm. before the accident based on research into the possibility of a big tsunami. They also say TEPCO lacked a sense of urgency and imagination and was not proactive as a result. The committee says a safety myth blinded TEPCO executives. It says they believed a serious accident could not happen, so they did not educate and train employees to deal with worst-case scenarios. Members of the committee also criticized Japan's nuclear safety agency. They say regulators failed to fulfill their mission to review disaster control measures at nuclear plants. The Diet Commission says it wasn't just the tsunami that damaged Fukushima Daiichi. Actually, the earthquake might have played a role. If that's true, 
the operators uh, and regulators would have to review the ability of nuclear plants to withstand quakes. Uh, what does the government committee report say on this matter? The committee looked at the radiation and pressure levels in the containment vessels between the start of the earthquake and the time the tsunami hit. It says the damage before the tsunami was not serious enough to release radioactive substances. But investigators did not define the damage caused by the earthquake and the damage caused by the tsunami. More analysis on this key point is needed. The Diet and government panels will be disbanded. What are the prospects for further investigation? And no decision has been made. And members of both panels are calling for the government to continue the investigation. We said the investigation must carry on because the accident is still ongoing. We can't believe an investigation that requires observation for a long period of time should be thrown to its end. A government official told us they are considering establishing a department for the investigation in the new regulation agency, which is going to start in September. There are still more questions than answers when it comes to the nuclear disaster. We will keep following the investigation and evaluations. The meltdowns and explosions at Fukushima Daiichi last year released radiation over a wide area. Crews have been decontaminating parts of northeastern Japan, but they're only now tackling one of the toughest jobs. Some of the residential areas that were once part of the 20-kilometer no-go zone surrounding the nuclear plant. Crews got started Friday in Tamura. The government reclassified the city in April, allowing people to be there during the day. More than 2,500 residents are still barred from permanently returning to their homes. Workers started by gathering leaves and cutting brush at shrines and graveyards in the area. Residents want these areas decontaminated first so they can visit family graves during the Buddhist Bon holidays in August. Some of them joined in the work. I feel a little anxious but I want to cooperate as much as possible. Someone needs to do it. The Environment Ministry hopes to decontaminate 400 houses along with 420 hectares of farmland and forests by the end of March. The government hasn't decided a date for when residents can return home. More than half of these municipal governments have yet to come up with their own decontamination plans. The biggest obstacle is finding temporary storage sites. Finding places to stockpile the contaminated soil and other waste is proving to be a major challenge. Our ministry will handle it responsibly. The government expects the decontamination work in all 11 municipalities to be completed by the end of March 2014, with the exception of some highly radioactive areas. Japan's government has warned that the disaster hit northeast is facing an unprecedented population decline. The government's annual economic report released on Friday said that about 40,000 more people moved out of the three worst-hit prefectures than moved in during last year. The situation in Fukushima Prefecture since the March 11th disaster is especially serious due to the impact of the nuclear accident at the Daiichi plant. Now, the report also says the number of students who hope to find jobs outside these prefectures has grown by about 30 percent, while significantly fewer want to stay. The report calls for stepped-up reconstruction efforts, warning that a plummeting population could undermine the foundations of the regional economy. Thousands of people in Japan are on the front lines of a fight against an invisible enemy. They're cleaning up the radiation that leaked and is still leaking from Fukushima Daiichi. Some of them work at the damaged nuclear plant and others in the towns and cities surrounding it. 
Either way, they all rely on one key piece of equipment and the people who shrugged off health fears to stay in northeastern Japan to make it. NHK World's Jun Yotsumoto has the story. Hundreds of thousands of workers are part of the cleanup operation in Fukushima. Radiation could be anywhere. So, they are required to wear plenty of protective gear, boots, gloves, and thick clothing. Masks are also part of their work wardrobe. They could make the difference between staying healthy and getting sick. We cannot go without masks. The meltdowns and explosions at Fukushima Daiichi released a massive amount of radiation into the environment. Decontamination crews use disposable masks. Workers at the plant have more durable varieties. That's created a booming mask-making business in Japan. Suppliers have been racing to keep up with demand. The manufacturer that's leading the way is located here. Atsuo Futami is in charge of the factory, which the earthquake partially damaged. It produces about 90% of protective masks used at nuclear plants across Japan, including Fukushima Daiichi. Demand increased five-fold after March 11, 2011, to 300,000 masks a month. If we didn't supply masks, workers at the plant wouldn't be able to work to contain the nuclear accident. If the accident cannot be contained, that would put all of Japan at risk, I thought. Futami faced a dilemma because he didn't know if it was even safe to be in the factory. It's outside the evacuation zone surrounding Fukushima Daiichi, but he's still worried his 100 workers could be exposed to radiation. If their work wasn't making masks, they would have wanted to evacuate to a safer place because we had no information about the radiation. Jun, you showed us one example of a Fukushima company making the best of the bad situation in the prefecture. How have other businesses responded to the nuclear crisis? Some are also benefiting. For example, workers need to use special bags to store contaminated soil. Local authorities who buy those bags are giving priority to Fukushima manufacturers. Local businesses are also expected to get contracts when it comes time to haul contaminated soil to storage facilities. As of now, authorities have not decided where to put those facilities. It seems firms in Fukushima will dominate the decontamination work. It's something of a mixed blessing, but it looks like the disaster will create jobs in the prefecture. How is the government helping with the recovery effort then? Prime Minister Yoshihiko Noda's cabinet approved a basic plan on July 13th to rebuild Fukushima. He wants to stop people from leaving the prefecture and promote reconstruction. The plan clearly states the government is responsible for allowing utilities to build nuclear power plants in Fukushima. So it said the government will do everything it can to rebuild the prefecture and people there need help. Fukushima officials say the prefecture's main farm products, such as cucumbers, broccoli, and rice, only bring in, bring in about 70 to 90 percent of pre-disaster prices. It will take a long time before Fukushima will be back to what it was before March 11, 2011. During the prefecture, I realized the um, revitalizing the economy isn't just about the government plans or the promotion of local products. The key lies in the sense of responsibility and love residents have for their home.